am Dr. Jonathan Mathias Lassiter. I am a licensed clinical psychologist, professor, and author of the upcoming book, How I Know White People Are Crazy. So be sure to get that when it comes out, okay? All right, I have the pleasure of moderating this panel today with our experts up here. So we're gonna get right into it. I'm gonna have each of them introduce themselves and then we're gonna get into the conversation because I know that's what you came for. Hi everyone, my name is Mina B and I'm a licensed social worker and the author of the book, Owning Our Struggles. Hello, I'm Dr. Judith Joseph. I'm a board certified psychiatrist and chair of Women in Medicine at Columbia University. Hi, how you doing? I'm Doma T. Pongo. I'm the host of MTV's True Life Crime. And uh, when I'm not doing true crime stuff, I was hosting a pre-show for the VMAs, which was a little funner than uh, the stories I normally tell, but it's great to be with you. Hello, everyone. I am uh, Rezma Menachem, the author of My Grandmother's Hands um, and Monsters in Love. Thank you, thank you. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. What up, Joe? What up? <laughs> I am Shaka Singor, and I'm just happy to be here with all y'all beautiful, beautiful, dope black people. So I'm excited for this conversation. Yeah. Yes, I'm excited to have you all here, and I'm excited to have you here. So first question. There's so much animosity out there in the public discourse, you know, conversations at the cookout online about romantic relationships between black men and women. So how might we promote a conversation of healing between heterosexual black men and women who wish to be romantically involved each other based on actual data and not the hype? How might we do that? Y'all know Ebony D.K. Williams recently got it hot, right? She stayed in the news, so that's influencing a lot of people. But how might we help our folks move beyond that? I think it's important to validate the data. And if we know the statistics, it really does show that black women are seen as basically at the bottom of the list of uh, attractiveness. And that's what the data shows. And is it right? It's absolutely wrong. But a lot of things play into that. And also a lot of the data shows from the Pew Research Center that um, of the educated black men, they're more likely to marry outside of their community than the educated black women. So we wanna validate that, we, but we also, you know, we wanna validate that truth is, is existing, but we also wanna address what's behind it. And I think we have to start with understanding what's happening within ourselves. A lot of what we talk about is attachment theory. Why do you attach the way you do? Why do you have anxious attachment? Why do you have fears of abandonment? Why do you have fears of relationships? So we want people to start working on themselves first and then start looking outward as to why the systemic issue is happening in the first place. I'm glad you talked about the systemic piece because that's a big part of it. Anyone else want to speak on that or anything else related to this question? I love to add something to that. You know, I, I think we live in a culture right now where we're hyper dependent on people who are sitting at home behind their computers, making up narratives that fit how they feel. And we don't talk about like what's real. So I got to ask you auto, audio, audience participation thing real quick. Look in your list of favorites on your phone. Like everybody looking at the list of your favorites on your phone. Are those people honorable? Are those people that you love? Are those the people that you respect? That's where our real narratives has to start coming from, is from our community. The real people we have access to, the real people we talk to all the time, the real people we're in community with, and we have to stop being over-reliant on somebody who's having a bad relationship day, and then they write back with the same person they were just, you know, talking about online. And so I think we give way too much agency to what other people are doing in their life. Uh, there's the entitlement we see people show up in like people life, you don't know these people. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But who is in your community that you can really be sharing and building love with in a real way? And I'll add to that by saying I do think we also have to redefine our metrics of success. Mm. Because in American culture, we see success as you're a homeowner, you make six figures, and all of these outward appearances and what Dr. Judith spoke about in regards to attachment theory, we also have to understand outside of how much someone makes, outside of the accolades that they have, I want to know, are you someone who knows how to communicate in a healthy way? Are you someone who knows how to regulate your difficult emotions when you feel angry? Are you someone who brings reciprocity to a relationship, vulnerability, but most important, safety? And so there's going to be a bunch of narratives that's rooted in opinions on the internet around what people consider a healthy relationship 
relationship that really fits in societal norms that can be very oppressive. And we really have to focus on the data of what actually helps cultivate a healthy relationship. And so you can earn six figures but be an emotionally volatile person. You know, and so if we're not doing that inner work of assessing how we show up in the world and how we show up in our relationships, we're not going to be able to see a change in our culture around that. I, I, I think um, I think when it comes to long term relationships, they they actually operate differently than short term relationships. If you're just trying to get down with somebody, that's a whole different thing than trying to live with somebody for 15 and 20 years, <laughs> right? The vulnerability that it takes to actually be in a long-term relationship with somebody means it really is predicated on your ability to mature. Most of the people and most of the narratives that we see out here on the internet are immature narratives and relationships, right? This whole structure is built on immaturity. We don't interrogate why we are attracted to things, why we are connected to things, why things, um, why things make us mad, why things make us happy, right? We ne and, and, and we don't, you know, when it comes to attraction, I, I can't believe that there are actually black people that don't find other black people attractive. Wow. But think about that. That is not just a black people issue. That idea has existed on this country and in this country since the inception. So of course we're struggling with those ideas. White body supremacy is one of those things that becomes so kind of untouchable that we don't even know that is actually formulating our opinions of things. And so for me, as somebody who's done therapeutic work with couples for the last 30 years, for me, really getting people to slow down and interrogate things, slow down and begin to work with the pieces that they don't even know are operating in the background. I, I really love that you brought up that, that uh, interracial, attractional piece. And so that brings me to my next question because I work with high achieving black women in my private practice and a lot of them are really hurting, right? And I, and I can't fix it, you know, a relationship for them, right? I can't get them a relationship. But a lot of it is around the interracial piece. Whenever we talk about black relationships, that interracial piece comes up. So how might we help black people who interpret interracial dating or marriage as rejection and harm heal from that pain. I mean, that's, again, that's something I'm dealing with in my practice. Or alternatively, is interracial dating and marriage a symptom of something that needs to be healed? So what do you all think? I think it goes back in part to Dr. Ju Judith's point about reframing what the metrics for success are in a relationship. Because we have fit, we want our relationships to fit into society's ideal of what is the perfect relationship. So the man should make this much, the woman should make this much. What does it mean to reframe what do you actually need in the household? Do you need another high earner or do you need support in that household? I look at my sister as an example. She's a dentist and her husband is a dentist as well. When they first started, she was the one who encouraged him to go to dental school, et cetera. I know the black women already are like, I'm not finna build a man. I'm not finna encourage and do that. But I saw in my own household and in my family, her reframe how she thought about relationships, what she required, and what she actually needed. She needed support, and that didn't come in the form of a paycheck or what he was making or what her friends would think of this guy. And 20 years later, they're a union that I look to and want to model my union after when I do get married. So I think it's important to think about what is it that we actually need and where are we getting those metrics from, those KPIs from? Is it internal or is it external? I love how you said model because I treat children, adults, adolescents, and I always ask the children, where do you learn love from? How do you learn how to love? No one pulls you aside and says, this is how you're supposed to love. This is how you're supposed to pick someone. This is what you should be looking for. And because people don't learn how to love, what do they do? They model their relationships after their parents, their attachment figures, what they saw at home. But if that model wasn't a healthy model, then you're set up to fail. And so I think we really do have to have these open and honest conversations with our youth and talk about, well, what is healthy love? What is domestic violence? What is abusive love? What is narcissism? And you know, I mentioned that I trained at Columbia and I, I work uh, with the women in medicine. 
within medicine, there is just so much bias. They, they, you know, some people don't think that certain populations will understand concepts like narcissism. No, everyone understands it. We've all met a, a narcissist, you know? So we have to have these open conversations with our youth and teach them what healthy love is first, before you look for someone who has money, before you look for someone who has X, Y, Z, because it's really important to have healthy attachments because generational trauma is real. Mina knows that, she's written a great book about it. <laughs> And I want to add to that because I also find on this concept of love, though, what can be really hard in the black community is we live in a society that already doesn't love us. Mm -hmm. And so we have the burden of historical trauma yep. that now permeates into intergenerational trauma that now manifests through interpersonal trauma, but it also exists in systems and institutions as well. Yep. And so the question when it comes to is interracial dating an illness, it is an illness of white supremacy. Yeah. So, and, and it more so is the person's goal behind it. Because you can have preferences, and I think, I think a lot of the times because of classism as well and trying to really um, give uh, black children a proper education or engage in proper housing, we have to segregate away from our communities and now live amongst other uh, communities that are not black focused, right? And we don't see our culture there. So then you have a bunch of black people being raised in a predominantly white institution or predominantly white neighborhoods, and that's how they condition themselves, and that's how they socialize themselves. But I think also there's a difference between this is my preference, what I grew up around, what I'm attracted to, versus I don't think black women are beautiful. Yeah. Versus I hate black people. Yeah. Versus we're not good enough. We're not educated. And I think those are the narratives that we really have to eradicate because that is trauma existing in the body. And I also want to say, hey, you know what? We also want to do the work of protecting ourselves. So when it comes to the rejection, do you want to be with somebody who is still harboring that level of animosity inward because it's going to reflect upon you and how they treat you in that relationship as well? So I do think that we have to be thinking about in the concept of dating and love and all of these different things, how white supremacy is literally influencing the way we treat our own people. Thank you. You know, I, I, think, I think this idea of how do we address issues that are showing up in the black family, in black relationships, as a lot of times when these questions get framed, we're thinking about it as almost like individual couples or individual people, right? And one of the things that I wanna encourage us to start to begin to think about is that some of the structures that currently exist that, that we're using to try and address some of these issues are not gonna work. They simply don't work. We're actually gonna have to, have to transgress those, those structures and create something else. Like thinking about what's ailing black couples and the black family without thinking about how we begin to communally heal and develop ways of communal health, not just individual health, not just uh, couples health, you know, getting in and doing some couples work, but actually how do we begin to address these pieces that have affected us for four and 500 years? These pieces are not something that's just happening between me and my wife. They're happening in our homes, all of our homes, because that's the design of it. The structure of it was designed to wither and weather us. So I really believe that we have to begin to create and, and, and create new pathways, new accentuate, new crack, so we have different opportunities. And I, I, again, I love that you bring up structures. And I think what you're also, I think a lot of you are hitting on is that these structures were, are not made for us, right? They, they do not represent us and we're trying to fit into them. And if we're trying to fit into them, we're always gonna come up short. So how do we start to think beyond that and build new structures? I, lo I love that. I wanna move it to thinking about black children and the relationships we have with black children, because relationships just aren't romantic, right? So I have two questions related to that. So one is how do we continue to make space for religion, spirituality, and black culture 
alongside parenting LGBTQ plus children. One of my areas of expertise is black LGBTQ communities and helping parents navigate that. But it's really hard for a lot of them. Uh, but when we, we do have some public figures like Dwayne Wade, uh, Judge Mathis, Magic Johnson showing support, and then there's, you know, uh, very responses to that. But how do you, how do you help black parents? Because that's part of the community. That's family, that's black relationships. How do you help them? That's a, that's a great question. I'm happy you asked it. Um, you know, I actually got a chance to spend some real time with Dwayne Wade. And what I walked away with from that conversation was that Dwayne Wade is a father. Come on. He's a parent, period. Come on. And I think we have to stop running with tropes that cause harm when it comes to how we show up and parent. Children are children. If you are a loving, thoughtful, caring, uh, strategic parent, you'll understand that, that anytime you're in proximity to children, your role does not change because they're not biologically yours. Any child that's in my presence is my child. It's my responsibility. It's how I was raised yep. in the community I come from. And I think that what we do have to call out is when we have people demonizing these political figures who have tons of resources, right? Um, that we have to challenge that, those, those kind of narratives that's being created. Why would he show up for his child in this way? Because he's a damn parent. That's his responsibility as a father. Every one of us in this room has somebody in the community, in our family, that we're like, oh man, old, old Frank over there, you know what I'm saying? It's family, it's our community. And the more we start to focus on the solutions and what actually happens, as opposed to our perceptions, I think that's how we start really gaining real traction. Thank you for that. You know, I, I want to be clear about this. Um, my liberation as a black heterosexual man is directly tied into the liberation of my brethren in the LBGTQIA community. Like, like, like black, black gay, black trans, black lesbian people are part of my community. My, li t t my liberation can't be parsed out because of that. Right? And the more we begin to say that and understand that, the more our children will, be underst will understand that this is a safe place for them. Our children are committing suicide. Our black babies are committing suicide. I'm not interested in what their sexual orientation is at that point. So to the, to the degree as a, as a, like when I see my trans brothers and sisters refusing to allow the system to, to make them shut up and they're continuously pushing, that makes room for me because what it says to me is that this, this oppressive structure ain't as tight as I think it is. That there's ways to crack it open and accentuate the cracks. There's ways to bust it. Right? That's supposed to be our work as people who believe in liberation. Right? People who believe in liberation see the cracks. They go, they take the fugitive uh, understanding of it and they say, I'm going to do this because I may not see what, how this is going to turn out, but I know these are the breadcrumbs that my children's children's children need to eat on. That's why I do it. We don't need, like, 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 my, our liberation can't be monolithic. It, my liberation has to be dependent on your liberation. When you're out here talking for the LBGTQIA community, I should be voicing and, and I should be a strong voice as a heterosexual black man. I should be saying, yeah, I love that shit. Yeah, yeah. I love that shit because yeah. it gives me opportunity to say some shit. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. That's the way I feel about it. Can I love that too. Yeah, I see everybody want to talk. Go ahead, go ahead. And then, you know, as someone who treats children every day, parents come and a lot of times as parents, we think that or if our child is going to see a mental health provider, there's something wrong with me, right? It's not, it doesn't always reflect on your parenting. And learn the facts, learn the data. Uh, there's the Family Acceptance Project, it has a lot of data over the years. And we know that if you reject children because of their um, gender identity, their sexual identity, that there are really negative outcomes. You talked about some of them, suicide, substance abuse, um, you know. HIV risk. Yeah, a sexually transmitted um, infection. So there are a lot of outcomes that you don't want your child to have. And children want to be loved and accepted. So there are online support groups because for many 
a lot of them, ju they just don't know that those supports exist. They don't have enough information, but there are free resources that you can educate yourself. And they also have parenting groups. So you won't be alone in this. And I think from many people, they're just, they want to think about their child. They want their child to be protected. They don't want their child to be um, targeted. But at the same time, we know if we don't accept our children, there are really dangerous outcomes for them. I was just going to add that as black people, we're one of the only groups that find new ways to segment and marginalize ourselves. We're only 13% of the population, yet we find ways to say we use our own brown paper brag tests against each other. We find ways to say he's not a part of my community because he identifies this way. We can't afford to do that. I did an episode of True Life Crime covering Malaysia Booker, a trans woman from Dallas, and her mother laments the times that she spent saying that that was no longer her child she goes back and starts an organization called Transparency uh, to help parents learn how to mother and father their trans kids. But we can't have this enlightening moment after our loved ones have already passed away. The thing you said, you said that it, it's, I'm not the first person to say all black lives matter. A trans person told me we'll never be free until the most marginalized of us yep, yep. receive liberation. Mm -hmm. So we can't afford as black folks to, to, to say that, 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 to make, to further segment and minimalize our own humanity. I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional as I'm talking about it because it's, when I did, did this show, it put me in spaces where I didn't even realize what my privilege was as a black male and what it meant for me to speak on behalf of a Malaysia. And all I could think about is the phrase silence is violence, where all the times I was silent was just as violent if I, as if I did it myself. And we all in this room, especially black males, heterosexual males, have a, a, a challenge, a mandate to stick up for the most marginalized of us because we can't afford anything else. Yeah. I, I really appreciate that. It's reminded, me, it's reminded me of a South African principle called Ubuntu. And what it basically means is that I am because we are and we are because I am. Right, and so that you're, what you're all highlighting is the sense that we're all one community, regardless of what we name ourselves or how we love or whatnot. We're all one community, and if this, any of us is hurting, we're all hurting. I think also that peace goes back because you were mentioning systems and white supremacy. Our culture, our culture is our greatest strength, and I heard someone earlier say that we don't even know our culture as black communities. I do a lot of talks about black LGBTQ issues and one of the things like but well, this didn't exist in Africa was like actually it did it's documented we have so much of this history black LGBTQ people have always been part of that and why wouldn't it be right but I want to move on again related to culture because again I think our culture is really our strength and we don't own it enough um, with the current assault on education in places like Florida what can we do to fortify our children's culture and mental health? Again, I think the more we understand about ourselves and love ourselves for who we are, our blackness, our Africanness, our so, so on and so forth, th we then have self-esteem. That helps our self-worth, but it's being eroded. So how do we help fortify that? Because they ain't teaching it to them, right? And truthfully, they never really were, right? So how do we do that? How do we fortify it? So this, this is one of my favorite subjects, uh, not only because I'm a writer, but because I'm also a dad and I'm also formerly incarcerated. And one of the things that we did when I was in prison that was integral to who I am today was we were intentional about creating book study groups. Come on. Uh, we read every type of book you can imagine, every type of book you can think of. And part of it was we wanted to undo some of the damage we had caused to our community. We wanted to uproot some of the trauma we had experienced as kids. And we wanted to ensure that when we returned to the community that we came back as assets as opposed to liabilities. And so we had accountability book groups, you know, where it wasn't you can just come out to the yard and say, hey, I read that book. We would interrogate you yes, on that sir. book. Uh, what happened in chapter such and such? What happened when this particular mindset became dominant? And so what I, what I believe is as, as a parent and as somebody who's deeply entrenched in community is that we have to hold that same standard. So one, our home is full of books. Um, you know, it's not a room that you can walk in where books aren't present and our son witnesses us reading all the time. He sees it in our work, he sees it in how we show up in our household and he also sees it in leisure. Um, I think that being able to be advocates for literacy when I was in prison, average reading grade was third grade. 
yet these guys were supposed to advocate for their own freedom when the court system had done them wrong. Impossible if you can't actually read and articulate an argument. And so for me, it's figuring out what are the other tools that I can communicate uh, with my son and that he can find communication in when he don't have time to read. There's audio books for those who can't uh, read. But I think the idea of, of acknowledging and recognizing, even within our culture, we talk a lot about culture, what do we celebrate within our culture? Hmm. And you can go across the spectrum of art and literature is at the bottom, unlike it was in the 60s when literature set the tone for every other art form to be acknowledged and affirmed. There would be no jazz celebration without a James Baldwin, without the Harlem Renaissance, without those brilliant writers who articulated our stories. We wouldn't know what it, like, what it looks like to fight for resistance if we didn't have Frederick Douglass' narrative of a slave, if we didn't have an uh, understanding of politics, didn't come without George Jackson's blood in my eye, and so on and so forth. And so we have to re-embed that in our culture. And I can say there are some artists um, who understand the importance of literature, not only as an artistic tool, but also as a liberation tool. And I'll shout out one in particular, my guy Nas, who is always inviting poets and orators onto his albums, myself included, so that we can get the message out for you to come back and get those books and disseminate them in a community that's in thirst of knowledge and wisdom that is about liberation, that is about connecting us in terms of relationship and helping us to uplift each other in a real way. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, well, my brother, what was so beautiful about the way he just articulated that is that what he was saying was, as a community, when he was in prison, one of the things that they did was had a clear understanding that there is a difference between communal scholarship and academic scholarship. Absolutely. Say it. Say it louder. There's a difference. Academic scholarship are these things that we move towards. That's what I want to be. That's where I want to go, right? Communal scholarships bubbles up from the community. Right. It's because there is a need and there, there is an agreement. There's an agreement that what we are going to do is going to be able to sustain our children's children's children and give time for our ancestors to rest. Absolutely. Right? And that's what you did. You said... Even though we are incarcerated, we are having agreement with things that are outside of these walls. Most definitely. Right? And so we're going to use the time to create our own. We're going to do me search, not just research. Right? We're going to do these pieces that allow us to be a different human being. A different human being. So often we go along these journeys and we want to stay the same idiot. <laughs> That's not, that's not how transformation works. Transformation works to ask you to get up against your edges and ask you to make choices about who you want to be now, in this moment. And that's what happened there. And that's what has to happen now for our community. Our community can no longer rely on this structure to educate our babies. We have the ability right now not to ask for permission we can literally create our own curriculums right now, right now, for our babies that incorporate addressing trauma, that incorporate movement, that incorporate recess. You know, they, take out, they took out recess. And the arts. They movement took everything. and art. We could literally do that right now. All it takes, you know, there, there's an old proverb that says, you stomp, you, you stomp me to the ground, but you forgot I was a seed. We need to understand that that is what is available to us right now. We don't need permission. We do not need permission. Stop asking these, these white folks <laughs> for, for permission. Right. <laughs> do it and figure out as you're doing it, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to lose money. You're going to do all the dumb shit. But at the end of the day, it's going to be yours. I appreciate that. And also, there are creative ways to learn about your culture. Because during Black Lives Matter, I got a lot of my both my black patients and my non-black patients coming to me saying, how can I teach my kids about black history and so forth? So there are, there are 
creative ways you can do it. Um, one of the things you can do is come up with recipes, cook together, learning about your history that way. Go to your school, find out what your child's school is learning. You can pull up the curriculum online, um, teach them in creative ways. So there are many ways that you can talk about history because a lot of the pati the, um, my patients will say that they were worried about showing their kids this and that, but your children already know about inequality. They know, they know about what's happening in the world, so there are different creative ways you can do that. And I will also say that your family history is part of that history. We don't always have to go outside and reach for Frederick Douglass. Reach for Frederick Douglass, but you don't, you don't have to start there, right? Because there are people in your family lineage who have overcome. That's why we're here today. Right, so go ahead. Yeah, and I just wanted to speak to the importance of investing back in our communities as well, especially around education, because not only is there an assault on our education right now, they are banning books written by black authors. So not only do they want to erase our history, they want to make sure our voices don't exist in the future. Absolutely. And so I think it's also important that we invest in this education by recognizing the importance of something as small as buying a book and how powerful that is for our people, but also recognizing space Spaces like this as a form of collective and community Absolutely. care. Yes. So every the seed is being planted in this room. It was probably planted before that, but now you can take all the resources you gain from here and go out there and continue to spread the word so that our culture continues to grow. So I also just want to make sure people realize education doesn't stop at the exit sign. It continues as we leave this room as well. As well. Absolutely. Yep. And real real quickly on the. Um, on the book ban, you know, I, I think it's so important that we really pay close attention to this. Um, in my experience, prison has always been a testing ground for things that they want to do to us. And if you go back through the history and anywhere they wanted to test out a new medicine, they'll do it in prison. That's right. They want to test out a new way of distributing currency, they do it in prison. They want to test out censorship, where does it start in prison? Uh, my book is currently banned in prisons right now. And the overwhelming response is like, why would you ban a book that gives people hope and inspiration? And that's exactly And the answer to that exactly. is because if we don't get our brothers and sisters out of that destitute mentality that leaves them to mass incarceration, then those companies that continue to invest in it continue to stuff their coffers. So we have to pay attention to not just what's happening out here, but we have a whole community of people that we are in relationship with inside prison. Our brothers, our sisters, our aunts, our uncles, everybody in this room has somebody who is impacted by incarceration that you're in relation with. And so it's important to understand that as we're having communal conversations about uh, relationships, we don't forget about the other part of our community, which are incarcerated brothers and sisters. I, I just want to say. Go ahead, final words. This last piece. This, this, has been, uh, this thing that um, Charlemagne has put together is now an institution. Yes. We have to start thinking about this, these gatherings as institution building, this not is part just of the work. a thing we come to and then, and then we forget about it. This is, this is literally an institution now. We have to begin to build on it and, 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 and help the rest of our communities understand that this is an institution that can be used, that can be used for our liberation and used to help us get free. Thank you so much to all of the panelists. That's our time and thank you all. And we look forward to talking to you out there.